sometimes feel a bit puzzling. Maybe it's that confusing car insurance policy or working out the right protection for your health, home and family. Or feeling unsure if your pension is on the right path. Aviva can help make these conundrums click. Helping solve your financial puzzles? It takes Aviva. Is what you're doing still doing it for you? I am EY. For a purpose that inspires me. And a culture that accepts. For a team that relies on me and makes me better for it. Knowing I'm always respected for being absolutely me. For my work to have meaning. Ideas becoming actions and my direction my own. For leaders that challenge, guide and support. Empowering me to be all I can and bring everything I am. My skills accelerated. My voice amplified. For always feeling heard and saying without hesitation. I love what I do. That's why. EY. Mom, I got the job! You got the job! Who got the job? <laughs> She got the job. She got the job. She got the job. Find your I got the job job on Total Jobs. Hi, my name is Darren Roos. I'm the CEO of IFS. We employ about 6,000 people and provide software to large enterprises around the world. We make an impact on young people by doing internships um, and hopefully showing them interesting ways in which artificial intelligence software can change the world. Uh, this is my Dubai Flip, where you'll learn about my career journey, my industry, um, hopefully a little about me, um, and throughout the conversation with Jack. Thanks for having me, Jack. How are we today? I'm good, thank you. I'm well, good. Welcome to my Dubai Flip show, podcast, call it what you want, uh, but we've got Thousands of youth tuning in. We also go live on LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitter, which is called X now as it's changed yes. overnight. We, we disabled the comments on Twitter because it's a bit of a sewage. Um, so all positive show. But I want to start here. And could you share your career journey in 60 seconds yep. from the start to where you got to now? Yeah, so uh, left school, uh, went to go study through correspondence. I still lived in South Africa at the time. I found it very hard, didn't manage to finish my degree. Uh, got into a marketing job from marketing after a couple of years, went into software. Uh, in 2005, or as recently as 2005, I was an individual contributor salesperson still. Uh, really found my groove in a, in a big global software business. Uh, managed to advance through the ranks. By the age of 35, I was on the global board of Software AG, which is a large listed software company, um, and now CEO of IFS. Wow, and you did it in 60 seconds, so brilliant. <laughs> Brilliant. And I want to go back right to the beginning. You, you, you just mentioned that you found it very hard in terms of school and kind of stuff. Tell me a little bit about your journey from school or education into your first job. What was your first job? What did that teach you? And what do you wish you knew before you joined that job that you want to pass on to young people? Yes, I think, uh, you know, I grew up in a generation when we started working really young. You know, I have a 14 year old son now. Um, and I think it's much harder, you know, I see in him this desire to want to work and do things, but, you know, society's changed so much. So my first job, I think I was 11 years old. Uh, my parents ran a holiday resort and uh, incredibly what I'm about to say, I mean, there's no way you could get away with this nowadays, but I used to drive a tractor, um, you know, it, it was a holiday resort and we used to pick people up in the car park and drive them to where they wanted to go in the, in the holiday resort and they, they handed a tractor over to an 11 year old, um, which seems a bit strange now, but, you know, I worked really hard. And I think, um, you know, at the time, it, it taught me the importance of hard work. And um, I've always had this philosophy that I can't guarantee that I'm going to be the most creative person in the room or the, the smartest person in the room, but I could always control that I was the hardest working. Um, and that's kind of been my thing throughout my career. Um, so, you know, I think 
I, I don't know that I didn't know it then. You know, I knew the importance of hard work, uh, but I think it's something that's that's become a foundation of you know my career. And, and what does hard work actually mean? Because I'm a big believer. If yes. I, I believe I'm not the smartest, I don't have no degrees. But if you work hard, be be loyal, and say what you're going to do, and do it well, then you win. But what does hard work mean mean to you? And how can a young person implement hard work yes. when they don't even know what work is? Yeah. So uh, I think that um, for me, it's it's a lot about sacrifice. Uh, being prepared to do the things that uh, you know maybe don't come naturally, that aren't easy to do. Um, I watched one of your previous episodes where you're talking about you know when you have a, a tough day and you're not feeling motivated. Um, and I, I reflected on the fact that you know I have those too. I think we all do. But I think the the the, the hard work piece is being able to overcome that. It is about being able to say you know I don't feel up to it today. I don't want to go to work. Um, I don't want to get up and you know do that next meeting. Uh, but being able to, to, to push yourself through it and go, look, I have a responsibility. There is an obligation and, and a responsibility here that I take seriously and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to you know, rally myself to go and, go and do it. Um, and know that it's okay to have a bad day. It's okay to, to not feel necessarily like you want to go and take on the world today, but that I'm going to find the, the fortitude to do it anyway. Find something uh, in you to just yeah. move forward. And you, I love the word rally. What do you do to rally? So if you're having one of those days where you know you need to work hard, but we all have those lazy days and those yeah. moments where, oh, I don't know if I'm going to be able to really put 100% in today. What are your rally tips? Yeah. So I think for me, uh, I think a lot about, you know, why I'm doing things. And, you know, for me, it's my family. There's a huge sense of accomplishment in, in what I've achieved. And I feel like, uh, you know, everybody has to have a motivation, whether that is I'm going to get to the weekend and I'm going to have the day off or, you know, I want to be able to buy something or, you know, whatever it is. Have it, you know, for me, it's, it's, it's quite mechanical. You know, I can't, it's, it, it can't be something fluffy. It needs to be something very specific. Um, and I think that helps me, you know, go, I'm going to do this uh, and then I'm going to get that. Um, if that makes sense. And do, d did your motivations change as you're, you got a little bit more experience in your career? And what, what was one of those moments that was a pivotal moment for you from on the tractor, on the result, yeah. to 30, in your 30s on a global board? Yeah. What, what do you think were the factors that got you there? And how did your motivation change in that period? Yeah, it's, it's a great question because I think... Um, I think up until, you know, my first job in software was for a big group in South Africa called Dimension Data and I was a, an individual contributor salesperson. And um, I, I enjoyed it and I had a, a boss that I enjoyed working for, but I didn't feel like I'd really found my groove. You know, I, I would, I, it was a bit of a clock in, clock out. I applied myself while I was there, but there was no real passion for what I was doing. I didn't feel like I'd found my calling. It, I wasn't loving what I was doing. Um, but it, but it was okay. Um, but when I left uh, Dimension Data and then went to Software AG, which was my, my first kind of uh, big step into enterprise software, I found a groove where it was completely different. You know, I, I just really loved what I did. It was, um, you know, I don't know, just it, it lent itself more directly to my skill set. Um, and I don't, you know, I didn't finish my degree either, so I completely relate to what you were saying. But I really found my groove. For me, this was... You know, I'd, I'd come to work and well, wake up in the morning and think about work and be excited about going. And that was a big difference. You know, it, it was like a, a six out of 10 in, in the first few years. That was a quarter, four or five years. Um, and then that next nine year stint where I went onto the board, ultimately, it was like I, I loved it. It was, you know, I, I managed to find a lot of enthusiasm around what I was doing. And I think that that step change is really what did it. And I think, you know, when I speak to, you know, I speak to my son or I speak to, to other kids, I think that's the key is to try and find something. It's cliche, I know, to find something that you love to do. But this wasn't, you know, this wasn't an easy thing to do. This wasn't a, a fun thing to do. This was really hard, mm. but I loved it. Um, and I think just accepting that you've got to maybe look for it, you know, that it might not come in your first job, might not come in your second job. Um, you know, I was, uh, you know, 27 years old odd before I, I went to Software AG. Um, and it was a, you know, it was a, it was a pretty staid old German software company. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't like a, a young, exciting company. 
but I found my groove there. And I think, you know, people trying to find, you know, their happy place and their groove is important. So it's really important to understand that your groove might, your groove might come in your first job, it might not. It yeah. might be in your second job, it might not. Absolutely. Or it might be in when you're 27. 100%. And that is okay. Yeah, 100%. And, you know, I think especially today, there's so much pressure. Um, somebody said something really interesting to me the other day, which I'm not really, I hadn't thought of before, which was the challenge with, uh, with um, you know, people today, especially the youth, because they've only grown up in this generation, um, is the disconnect between their expectation and reality. And we grow up in a world which is dominated by social media and, you know, all of your viewers will be seeing things about people's holidays and the cars they drive and, you know, everything about their lives and all the, everyone's posting the aspirational stuff, which creates an expectation. And then they have the reality of their lives. And that disconnect is what creates the problem. So you have a lot of people, a lot of young people who are like, but I, you know, I, I've, I've now come out of school and like, where is my exciting opportunity? Um, and it's not there, but it does take time to find it. And it might take, you know, 27 for me was, you know, it felt like a long time. You know, I'd, I'd been working from when I was mm. 11, but full time, you know, from when I was 18, having left school. Um, and, you know, so, so it was nearly 10 years of working to find something that I, you know, really got my teeth into. And you took so much sense. Like I, I grew up in a, a council estate. My house was really dirty. And this took me about 40 minutes to mop this morning, this floor. But you won't see a picture online of it. Do, yeah. do, do you see? So it's those moments. Yeah. It's the hard work to get to it, yeah. isn't it? It's, to make sure it's the... the yeah, it's the, um, I think there's a famous golfer. I forget who it was. Uh, or maybe an artist. I think it's actually an artist, sorry, who, who, who said that uh, you know, it took us 30 years to become an overnight success. Um, and I think that's what it is, you know, there's a tremendous amount of hard work that goes into it and people look at, 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 at successful people later in their career um, and go, you know, they were lucky, they, whatever it was, but a huge amount of work went into it and, and not just work, but there's, there is luck involved. There is a tremendous amount of luck involved, being in the right place at the right time, um, opportunity knocks and, 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 and taking those opportunities um, is extremely important. And how, how can a young person deal with being told to wait and things yeah. take time especially in a world where we do things so instantly and we want it now and yeah. and not everything can be now for instance they look at elon musk and he's just obviously he bought yeah. twitter and if they feel like that's just come out of nowhere yeah. a lot of people didn't know that he had paypal and he was part of that yeah. and that obviously went south and north or whatever it is in terms of he left that how what is your advice to young people when their manager, their boss, their company, or their dreams are being told to wait, be waited for, yeah. and things take time? Because that's quite hard to swallow, isn't it? If you yeah. said to me, oh, you have to wait 10 years, 20 years, I'm gonna like, whoa, yes. anxious. Yeah. I, I don't think there's any easy way to tell people to wait. You can't just say, be patient. I think the advice that I would give is, is try and enjoy the journey. Um, again, it's going to sound very cliche, but you know, when, when you get to nearly 50, like I am, um, you, you begin to realize that you're on, on the back end of your life. Uh, this is the, 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 I'm much closer to the end than I am to the beginning. Halfway, I'd say. Well, I hope so. <laughs> so um, that, that's more a genetic play. Um, but you know, you, you, when you reach this point, you, you realize that, that life is finite, you're gonna, depending on your religious beliefs, you, you're going to get one turn. I believe you get one turn and you have to make the most of it. And I think that there is a danger that, uh, that, you, that, that if, you, if you are very ambitious um, and you're frustrated by the, the, the things that you don't have, that there is a risk that you, that you don't enjoy the journey. Um, and that's extremely important, whether, whether you've got the job that you love to do or not, um, whether you're in the relationship that you hope you're in or not, uh, whether you're living where you want to live or not, like these every day, every you know, week, every month, every year is one that you're never going to get back. Um, and one thing is absolutely certain is that when you're, you know, when you're on your deathbed, looking back on your life, you're going to lament the things that, 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 you, that you didn't take the opportunity to do. Um, so, you know, I think for me, it's, it's not about telling people just to be patient. That's, that's not real. Just try and enjoy it. Try and enjoy all of it. The good, the good and hopefully not too much bad. But learn from it and yeah. enjoy it. And what's something that you believe that you've still not achieved that you wanna just to show that it, it does take yeah. a, it takes a long period. Yeah, I mean, I think I'm. 
I'm, uh, I think, I hope that I find some peace at some point. You know, for me, it's still, I find, uh, you know, everything that I do is, is, is very tightly wound. Um, I think the people that work with me would say that, my, the, you know, my, my family would say that, my wife, my kids, everything's very tightly wound. And I think, you know, I, I strive to try and find some peace and, 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 a, and, and a bit of more uh, appreciation and, and, and relaxation if that makes sense. And it's not about not working. You know, I, I, you, you can find that piece working. You can find that piece doing what you love to do. And I do love to do what I do. Um, but I hope that I, you know, it, but it's, so it's a self-development thing rather than a, an achievement. And how do, you, how do you balance that peace with ambition and wanting to drive forward your 6,000 people yeah. that you've got working for you and working for the organization? How do you find the balance and how do you know what to compromise on? Yeah. And you talked you talk about sacrifice earlier and I left that I left that word out for a minute but nice. I think everything in life is a sacrifice. I call it compromise. Yeah. If you're going to add something you're going to have to take something away. Yeah. You being here today means that you're not somewhere else. So how how do you manage that compromise and find that peace when you also want that ambition and success for your people, your family, your 14 year old, how, how do you do that? Well, I think the, the thing that changes as you get older is that w certainly as a, as a younger person, it was very much about me, my success, my ambition. Um, and I think as I've gotten older, it's, it's now I get it just as much, if not more satisfaction from making other people successful and, and helping them to achieve what they want. And I think it was interesting, I had breakfast with a, a senior colleague of mine today and we were talking about, you know, as you, as you, as you transition out of your executive life into, you know, post-executive mm -hmm. life, um, early on, you're, how do, how, have I been successful? Am I okay? What am I going to do next? Um, and, you know, I think a lot more now about how is the organization successful? What is, you know, IFS as a business, my business, uh, how, how does that, you know, perform and how do I make sure that we have the right leadership in place and the right structures in place so that when I leave in the future, um, that the business is successful. And that's about, you know, grooming the next generation of leaders. It's about, um, you know, making sure that other people are successful. And actually, it's, um, you know, the, 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 there's just a rationale to it, which is that, you know, the, the, the group of people are more likely to be able to come up with the next best idea or go and execute on something than I am on my own anyway. So you learn to to, you know, delegate better, um, manage, you know, better, uh, lead better, um, you know, as, as you mature. And that's not necessarily about age, but about experience. And what do you think is something that a young person who will come and work for a business doesn't know about the CEO role? Because they see the CEO yeah. role and they see, wow, CEO. Yeah. What's, what's something, what's an insider kind of, common trait that when you go and have these breakfasts or lunches yeah. with your peers uh, and they're all talking about their next portfolio yes. career or they've just joined their portfolio career or whatever it is, what's, what's something common that people that are not a CEO? Yeah, so I think that probably the most common misconception is that people think that uh, CEOs have the answers, that there's some sort of insight or knowledge or, um, you know, insight is the right word, superior insight that they have. Um, and that's just not the case. You know, I think one of the things that I try and do with my business is to be clear that, you know, the way I think about my role is, is that I have three stakeholders. I have shareholders, I have customers, and I have employees. And they're all important. Without any one of the three, our business can't be successful. So I have to navigate trying to keep all three happy. Um, and most decisions I have to make are going to upset one or more of the three. Um, and there's no perfect solution. So as, you, as, as I do the job and as every CEO does the job, they're going to make mistakes, that's for sure. Um, they're going to get things wrong. Um, they can't always show that um, because, you know, you, you need to project an image of confidence and people need to be able to com be confident that, that the direction you're taking them is the right direction. But I'm, I take a slightly different approach in that I'm very open. And I say, look, I'm going to try and do the best things for our three stakeholders as I can. And I will get it wrong sometimes. And when I get it wrong, I'm going to admit I've got it wrong. And then we're going to try and fix it together. Um, so with a fail fast uh, attitude. Uh, but I think that's probably the big thing is, is that people probably look at a CEO and go, 
you know, they've come up through their career, they've now got to this point, there's this uh, ideology or perfection um, that they execute on and that's just not the case at all. And where do you, where do you get your inspiration from? Who inspires you and where can young people go to be inspired yeah. in terms of, and in the second half we can talk a little bit more about the business and software and sure. why it's such a fantastic industry and how you can get involved as an intern as well in A, B and C. But what, where's your inspiration coming from and how can young people bolt onto good inspiration? Yeah. So I think it's slightly different. I think that um, for me, my, my inspiration comes from the people who I work with. It tends to be the team members who I get to engage with and I'm I'm driven, I, I hope they're driven to want to perform for me and I'm certainly driven to want to perform for them. Um, but I think that it's, it's different. If I think about my son, he's, as I said, he's 14. Um, for, for any young person, I think the most uh, effective way to do it is to try and find a role model that you can relate to um, and try and choose a good role model. Because I think in today's world, there are lots of role models that aren't necessarily good role models. But try and find a good role model somebody who you know you, you'd be proud to follow and then you know try and learn and 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 um you know adapt you you know to 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 what you learn from them i think that's probably the best advice that i can give and if possible have that be somebody who you can actually interact with you and i were talking earlier about a coach that you've got mm. i think that's the way to do it find somebody who you can interact with and there'll be people watching who don't necessarily have access to someone like that but then you know, choose a, a, an online persona or, yeah. or somebody, but somebody who, who's going to, you know, live the kind of life that you want to live, not aesthetically, but, you know, from a, a happiness perspective. And, and those people can come in places where you don't expect, right? Sure. And you talk about inspire towards good role models, yeah. which I, called, I call real models. What are, the, what are the three things that make a good real model because I'm, I'm thinking young people, they'll, they'll look online and they'll go, oh, that person is successful. They've got loads of money. Yeah. They're breaking the, the system. I don't want to mention any names sure. uh, in terms of bad role models. Yeah. But what should young people really consider in terms of a good role model? Well, I think the, the most important thing to remember is, is that, you know, financial success doesn't equal happiness. And I think that's... Uh, that's a really difficult thing for a lot of young people to get their heads around. Um, you know, and, and really what I would say to them um, is that if you look around and you think about um, you know, the, the stories that will be in the press or in the media in the next you know, seven days, you'll see tons of stories of hugely financially successful people who are desperately unhappy. Um, you know, suicide, financial ruin, you know, people who, who, you know, despite having had financial success are really not happy people. And so lost, I think, the, yeah. yeah, and because they've lost it or because, you know, because they have the money, uh, they've made poor decisions, whatever it is. So I think the first thing is, is recognize that that role model doesn't need to be somebody who's financially successful. It needs to be somebody who is happy <laughs> um, and somebody who's going to teach you things about being happy and being able to learn from that. So I think that's probably the first thing. Um, the second thing is, um, I think, I'm a big believer in, in diversity. So find somebody who's different. Um, you know, I had the opportunity a little while ago to, to meet um, a, 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 an, an Indian guru called Sadhguru and spend some time with him. And like, I, I'm, I'm not into that stuff, so to speak. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not a yogi or anything like that. So, you know, yoga is not a thing for me. I, I haven't typically, but it was super interesting meeting him and, and you know, listening to some of his philosophies and, and, and you know, the way he thinks about the world. Um, so think about diversity and so that you get different thoughts, get, 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 get different input to the things that you get in either the mainstream media or from the people around you. Um, and then I think the third thing is, is, is think about, um, I think, the importance of, of integrity or goodness, right? So try to find somebody who, who uh, is preaching a, a wholesome message. Because I'm a big believer in the expression, if you live by the sword, you die by the sword. And I think that it's all good and well to go, you know, I, I, I aspire to be more like this person because they're cool and edgy and, you know, maybe they're a bit gangster and, you know, I want to be like that. But, you know, those are the people that tend to end up in jail. Mm -hmm. um, and if that's what you aspire to, then that's great. Then you should follow someone like that. 
but I, I would hope that, that, that people watching this, that's not what they aspire to. So I think those are the three things. A bit of diversity, make sure you're getting some different thoughts, somebody who's good, and then recognize that financial success doesn't equal happiness. Wow. We're going to take, we're going to take a break because we've been talking for 22 minutes already, okay. and this has been so fantastic. Cool. But everyone, while we're on a break, we're going to take a six-minute break. Think about those influencers that are on your TikTok, TikTok channel right now. Decide whether you want to unfollow them or not. That's the question I've got for everyone. And we'll see you in a minute. There's nothing clever about selling yourself short. Oh my God. I can't tell you how many people, when you dig into their success stories, look how many failures they had first. And what marks them out is their character. And you can control your character. You know, how you respond to loss, how you respond to adversity. And what was the last thing you lost? My job, um, uh, I suppose. You've got to be honest with yourself, what went wrong. You've got to then have a realistic plan to put it right. And, you know, bags of determination and self-belief. And the fear of failure, I think you've got to get over that. How do you not let that get to you? I wouldn't say love the adversity, but respect that the adversity will make you better. I've been privileged to see you at various different junctures, and it was very inspiring then, but look how far you've come. It's amazing. <laughs> and if you just relentlessly focused on moving forward, learning the lessons of life, I think it's a recipe for success. And don't let others dictate to you your view of the world, let alone yourself. I said I wanted to be true to my convictions. I wanted to find the right life partner and give my kids the best opportunities I could. Deutsche Bank is the largest bank in the UK that you have never heard of. You know, the environment's very challenging, I think, for young people. Therefore, seek out every opportunity. Don't underestimate how long it's going to take to get up in the morning. <laughs> and I always say, if you're not five minutes early, you're late. I think when anyone is starting a Saturday job and you're a teenager, the biggest thing is getting out of bed. That commitment piece is really important. We know that there are young people for whom actually going to university, spending three, four years, isn't something that they want to do. They want to get out into the world of work immediately. We've got an operations talent program, lots of different types of ways in which you can actually come into the organization and understand what's available. So go into a meeting looking for that curious conversation. Absolutely. Room. So I think it's always striking a balance between not sort of interjecting at the wrong times or too frequently, whilst at the same time, if you genuinely have something to say that can add to the conversation and to the discussion, you should absolutely say it. So even though I've been at the bank for 25 years, I feel like I've had five different careers. It's a cliche, but really fake it till you make it. We're looking to grow our businesses. That really is the best advice. Finances can sometimes feel a bit puzzling. Maybe it's that confusing car insurance policy. Or working out the right protection for your health, home and family. Or feeling unsure if your pension is on the right path. Aviva can help make these conundrums click. Helping solve your financial puzzles? It takes a viva. Is what you're doing still doing it for you? They, she, we, he. I am EY. For a purpose that inspires me. And a culture that accepts. For a team that relies on me and makes me better for it. Knowing I'm always respected for being absolutely me. For my work to have meaning, ideas becoming actions and my direction my own. For leaders that challenge, guide and support, empowering me to be all I can and bring everything I am. My skills accelerated, my voice amplified. 
for always feeling heard and saying without hesitation, I love what I do. That's why. EY. Mom, I got the job! She got the job! Who got the job? Granny! She got the job! She got the job! She got the job! Yeah. Find your I got the job job on Total Jobs. I'm so excited, I can't tell you, you know, I just want to scream and shout. Have you ever had an experience where you've gone into a job and thought, oh, what have I done? I felt sick to the pit of my stomach that I've made a bad mistake. I mean, I was ashamed to get a final written warning. And it is the ability to be able to take those, um, those situations and genuinely learn from them without letting them destroy you. Today's news is tomorrow's chip paper. So if it doesn't feel right, if it doesn't look right, it probably isn't right. You know, an awful lot is common sense. And one of the surprising things about common sense is it's not very common. Make your choice. Make the choice conscious, and then when you are wherever you are, be present when you're present. Am I learning? Can I have influence? And am I going to enjoy this? In any situation, there are things you control and there are things you can't control. You've got more control than you realise, but equally, don't fret about the things you can't control, because that is the definition of madness. There's One a real counts. lesson there, isn't it? It's find the miracle in every situation. Yeah. Yeah. Failure is not fatal. Your ability to bounce back and be resilient for me is the thing that has made me who I am. So we're back for the second half, and you've uh, you've not left, which is a good thing. I always say to the guests that they can leave at half time. You haven't sent me away. Either. Yeah, that, that's true. Yeah, so we're we're both still here, which is good. I want to talk a little bit about the business and a little bit about what your business does, what type of roles there is, what what is exciting coming up that you can share, sure. uh, kind of thing. Tell me a little bit about the business, and then I would love to hear a little bit about the industry as a whole. Yeah. What are the challenges? What what do you want to see in the next generation bring into the industry? Yeah. So uh, first of all, IFS is a software company. We operate in the enterprise software space. So typically our customers are kind of half a billion upwards in revenue. So, you know, on the extreme, we have customers like the US Navy who use our software to run maintenance on bigger aircraft carriers through to telcos and, um, you know, all asset and service centric companies using our software for field technicians, asset management, etc. So it's, it's big, complex stuff. Um, when we sell the software, you know, what a lot of your viewers will be used to is, you know, you buy a piece of software on your phone, you download it and you start to use it. A lot of our software we sell and then it takes, you know, maybe a year or even longer to implement the software before the users actually start to use it. Wow. So it's quite complex stuff. Um, but it's, uh, for me, it's an interesting industry because it really, um, it requires a lot of, of um, uh, I guess a lot of domain expertise, like we need a lot of experts, both in the software as well as in our customers' businesses. Um, and it's uh, from a competitive perspective, because I think whenever you start any business, you're thinking about the barriers to entry and you're thinking about the competitive landscape. You know, the, the barriers to entry are extremely high. There are millions of lines of code in our software, so we can't have an upstart competitor come into the market. That's good. Uh, we couldn't, I'm gonna come back to that. Um, and then the second thing is, is that, you know, our, our, our salespeople, our consultants, our support folks, our R&D people, they all have deep industry expertise. So they're experts in telco, they're experts in oil and gas, they're experts in, uh, you know, uh, utilities. Um, and that's how we sell. So we're engaged, understand the customer's problem, and then figure out how our software is going to help solve that solution. So that's broadly what we do. 
where uh, this year we'll do about $1.3 billion in revenue. Um, we have about 6,000 employees, um, and we actually released our financial results today, actually. Um, and uh, over the last five years, we've grown at a compound annual growth rate of over 30%. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a fast growing, large enterprise business. So very proud of it. Wow, wow. And what are some of the things that a young person who might say, oh, actually, I wanna be part of the uh, team of 6,000. Yes. What, what kind of roles will they do? And what yeah. are the entries, entry levels for them to get involved? Yeah. So we do a ton of internships, um, and if you go to our website, there's always information there. Uh, but I think, you know, it doesn't really matter what somebody wants to do. Um, we would employ just about, you know, across the whole business in some way, shape or form, nearly anybody, unless maybe you're a doctor or something like that. But we, we employ people who look after our facilities, we look after, we, look, we hire coders, we hire, um, uh, you know, uh, lawyers, we hire accountants, we, you know, you name it, we hire it. Um, and as the business grows, there's always a demand for those things. I think I said I'm not yet as the barriers to entry, but the big change uh, in our industry, like it is for all of the, the, the young people watching this, uh, is the, the, the impact that uh, generative AI and artificial intelligence in general is going to have on the workplace. And what it does is, I think that f for us as a company, we see it as, a, as an existential threat and we see it as a generational opportunity at the same time. So it's an existential, existential threat because if somebody can figure out how to leverage generative AI in order to write an application that does what our does, then we, we have a new threat that wouldn't have been there before and potentially could be a, a, a significant threat to our business uh, and a, a bunch of other very large enterprise software companies. Uh, but the generational opportunity is that if we can figure out how to leverage artificial intelligence in a way that nobody else has, then we can find ways to leverage our software in ways that nobody else has uh, in order to, to win and, and, and to beat the competition. And, in, and I, I mentioned that uh, opportunity and threat because it's exactly the same for you know, the young people watching, which is that um, until today, the fact that they are young and have less experience and less knowledge has been a fundamental threat or, or hindrance to their ability to do certain things. You know, that's just the reality. If you, if you didn't know stuff, if you hadn't experienced stuff, um, you couldn't do it. But with generative AI, the windows is, is opening for younger people to materially offset the, the gap um, in a sustainable way forever. Um, and already, you know, we think about um, the, the, the kinds of people that we recruit. Are you hiring people that have specific knowledge and experience, or are you hiring people that have the tools that will enable them to get the knowledge and experience at a, at a high, way higher level than anybody could possibly have themselves. Um, and I think, you know, in our organization today, we're really encouraging people to, to experiment with generative AI, but I think that there is a massive opportunity, and I've, you know, as I said, I've said this to my son, to, to Luke, um, go after this. This is a, this is a generational opportunity, um, and you have an opportunity to do things today that um, you could never have done five years ago. You couldn't have done it two years ago. I think that's a massive, massive opportunity for everybody watching. And start small, right? Play with it. Play with just it. Just play with it. So yeah. I'm, I'm dyslexic, so I find it really hard to write. Yes. Yeah. And I wanted to look. Just speak. Ten, ten just days, dictate. Yeah. Ten days ago, I said, I want to turn the My Do They Flip into a blog. And using AI, in ten days, we've been able to transcript. So when you're speaking, yeah. it'll transcript Boy. it all. It'll turn it into five top tips, yeah. it'll put it out online on LinkedIn, and in 10 days we've had over 12,000 subscribers with about 6,000 uh, reads on each yeah. article, and I've launched f four articles. Yeah. And I strugg I've struggled all my life with writing, but AI yeah. come into play. I'll give, a, I'll give a tangible example. So uh, our head of marketing and com communications writes our quarterly results announcement. Um, and typically what would happen is uh, she would write it, she would then send it to our CFO who would check it, we'd send it to someone else who would check it, uh, it'll go back into marketing, they'll tweak it some more, and then it'll come to me to take a look at, I'll probably tweak it, um, then it goes back through that whole check again. Um, this morning, uh, again, just on the way in, I literally copied and pasted the, just the key financial numbers 
from our release, put it into ChatGPT4 and hit enter, and asked it to, to write the res a results announcement for an enterprise software company. And what it spat out, objectively, I think was better than what we released today. Um, and you know, now you're, you're effectively, instantly replacing the knowledge and experience of a handful of people who have been doing this for many, many years and could do it because they have that experience with a tool that a 16 year old would, would be able to learn to use in five minutes. Mm. That's the opportunity, it's huge. So do you see, what should, what should young people do in this moment, hearing this right now? What should they be doing? How should they be running? I'm a big believer, don't run away from something, run towards it. Yeah. Should they be running towards AI? What should they be doing? How do they promote that they now know AI? And Yes. Because I, I totally agree with you. And then what is the, for the entrepreneurs, we've got some young entrepreneurs who have built their businesses tuning in as well. Yes. What would your advice be to them? Because you go on all these uh, SaaS platforms now, and with that, it Bart, Bert, Bert. You've got every single name ever. Yeah. I've not seen a Jack one yet. <laughs> but you've got, or oh, Darren, but you know, who knows, tomorrow there might be a Darren AI pop-up. What is the, what should these, so two questions, what should young people who want to be employees do with AI as a next step? And yeah. what should young entrepreneurs do with AI? Yeah, so let's start with the employees first. So I think that um, there's a job description which I've started to hear people talking about now, which is a prompt engineer. So the, the, for, for your, you know, the people watching's benefit, um, typically you'd have software engineers and they would have to learn to code and you'd get different versions of that, different programming languages and so on. But what's happening now is, is that you, you, you have to learn how ChatGPT or whichever generative AI you're, you're using, how it works, how to prompt it. So I think that there's an emerging category of employee which is a prompt engineer. And I think just having fiddled with it over the last couple of months myself, I've gotten a lot better so at it. So you're a prompt engineer? I'm, I'm, I'm a novice prompt <laughs> engineer. Um, but I think there's definitely an opportunity there as an employee. Um, and, and there is no question that that will become a thing. You know, I, I, and is there it roles is live that you can I, change at I the think, moment? I think that uh, that's a great question. If there aren't, there will be imminently. Now, I think the challenge is, is that I think that the... the whether the industry thinks of this as I'm hiring a prompt engineer or whether the industry says I'm hiring a, a copywriter, the reality is, is that the copywriter of the future is a prompt engineer. Uh, probably the lawyer of the future is a prompt engineer. It's not, you know, those roles will be redundant. There's no, you know, that's fairly well understood. Um, but understand that that is the skill set that, that, that you will need as a, as a young person. So that, that's what I would say for employees, and, and that's something that they can, you, you can get used to now. You know, write a love letter to your, your respective other using, you know, chat GPT, and you'll Hire be amazed. Hire a prompt engineer. Yeah, well, you know, they need to practice it themselves. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's the thing. Um, so I think, uh, you know, that, 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 but get, for, get playing with it. You know, it's free, it's accessible, you know, see what it can do. Get, get the idea of how the prompts and changing the prompts and the level of detail you give it is going to change the outcome. Um, so that's the one thing. And then for entrepreneurs, recognize that um, in, in any business, you have to think uh, about the, the, the threats as much as you think about the opportunities, because very often thinking about the threats tell you where you should be going. Um, and I think that if, if there are very few industries today that will not be disrupted by um, the, this current generation and the next generation of artificial intelligence. So think about that. Think about how your business could be disrupted. Um, because, you know, blockbuster videos, you know, they didn't think they could be disrupted until the next generation of, of, of you know, streaming came along. The music industry didn't think it could be disrupted. Uh, Blackberry didn't think it could be disrupted. And, and there was a level of naivety that led to their complete demise. And I think that everybody, irrespective of how big your business is, needs to recognize that threat. Um, and think about how you can leverage this technology, which is fully democratized. That's the big difference. You know, if you go back 20 years ago, new technology would come out, but typically that new technology, whatever it was, would be very expensive. The hardware to run it would be very expensive, and only the biggest companies with the most money could get access to it. But because of cloud software and because this has been fully democratized, anybody can use this. Um, and almost certainly, the, 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 as with any big generational shift, 
the, the companies that are at the top of the pyramid today, once the shift has you know, rolled out, will not be at the top after it. Um, and you know, anybody watching could be you know, one of those leaders in the future if they have, if we go back to where we started, if they go back and they work really hard and they seize the opportunities. And will, will you be hiring some prompt engineers? For sure, and... absolutely. This, this morning I interviewed someone to lead our AI, you know, be our chief AI officer. Um, and you know, that's about, he, I think his biggest challenge will be how do we get every function within our business to be thinking about how we leverage uh, AI in the business um, and the people who are going to be doing it are going to be prompt engineers. Wow. So there you go. Look at becoming a prompt engineer as so. of the future. Brilliant. What, I, want, I want to turn a little bit to young people and what you look for when hiring. Young person coming to an interview, tell me a little bit about what they should be doing, what they shouldn't be doing. Because there's loads of information out there. I know the climate's changed. Some interviews will now take your first interview might be for a test or it might be online. But what, what should the young people be doing? I come to interview with you today, Darren. Yeah. What would you be looking for me, from me? So I, I mean, I, I hire for attitude. I like to hire people who have a great attitude. Um, I think that when, when we have people in the business who are hardworking and enthusiastic and have a sense of urgency and they're positive, then everything else we can compensate for. If they don't have the knowledge, they don't have the skills, all of that is fixable, um, especially in the world of AI. Uh, but, but even before that, you know, I, I was very much focused on attitude, work ethic, uh, you know, positivity, urgency, you know, make sure they're arriving on time, make sure that they're presentable. And, and I think importantly, empathy is something that, that a lot of people don't talk about a lot. You've got to be thinking, you know, I'm going for this job. If I was in that person's shoes, what would I be looking for? Uh, and I think that if, if, if you go for an interview and you put yourself in the hiring manager's shoes and you go, okay, whether it's a shift at McDonald's or whether it's you know, a consulting team at, at PwC, or whether it's a, you know, an engineering team at IFS, that hiring manager wants somebody who's gonna show up, who's gonna work hard, who's gonna make a contribution. And I think that if you recognize that, and you come to the interview with, with, with what you would want if you were in their shoes, and you're thinking about that, then I think you're gonna interview better 100% of the time. Because you know, you're gonna want somebody who's confident. You're gonna want somebody who demonstrates a desire to learn. You're going to want somebody who, uh, you know, who, who uh, seems to be able to relate to, to, to what you're looking for in the role. And that's always going to interview better than somebody who you know, shows up who's maybe a little bit apathetic um, about the situation. And what's, what's one thing or two things that would be a completely no-no and would, I mean, would get I'm you a, to stop the interview like and get a... a timekeeper for me... You know, you've got to arrive on time. It's, like if, if people can't arrive on time for an interview, then that's a huge no-no. And I've had people who have arrived late because, you know, a train or traffic or something like that, and, but then they've called in advance or they've sent an email and they've gone, look, like I've got a problem, I'm, I'm, I'm on my way. Life happens, that's okay. But don't, don't arrive late and be blasé about it. That, that's, that's like instant showstopper for me. Um, and then I think... Um, I always say, if you're not five minutes early, you're already late. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. I think then the other thing is show some interest. I think that if you're, if you're going to go work somewhere or you want to go and work somewhere, have taken 10 minutes or 15 minutes to go online. Uh, you know, today, I, and I know because, of, as I said, my son, you know, he's going to have watched 100 TikTok videos this morning. Anyway, watch 50 TikTok videos and spend the rest of that time just doing a little bit of research on the company. You know, go onto their website, you're going to be able to have a high level idea of what they're, do what they're doing, why they're doing it, um, you know, what, what are their priorities, where's the business going, get, get a high level overview of where the business is going and then, you know, when you go for the interview, you can weave that into the conversation as opposed to just, I'm going to do 20 interviews, I'm just going to show up for all of them and hope that somebody likes me enough to give me a job. We had the chairwoman of FA on, Debbie fantastic individual and she said go onto the website find the annual report 
and look at what they're doing for diversity, inclusion and stuff. And I love that yeah. in terms of find what their annual your reporting year is. What else? What's, what's something else that they can do? So they, they've taken Debbie's advice and yeah. they've gone on and they've uh, looked at the annual report and see how they're performing in terms of diversity and inclusion and stuff. What other things should they be looking on a website? Because a website you go onto, it can be overwhelming. Yeah. I went on your website today for 15 minutes. And yeah. I'm like, okay, you've acquired, you've, acquired yes. a, you've acquired a business. Who is that business? <laughs> then I started yes. going down a tower. Oh, I thought I better stop. He's, yes. he's going to be here soon. But what, what are the things that you would say, go here, here, and yeah. here? Uh, look, I think Debbie's advice for going to the annual report is extremely important. And the reason is that uh, in the annual report, there's going to be a statement right up front from the chairman or the CEO. And that's all you need to know. The, the, the reality is, is that they, they will always lay out the strategy and what the business does in that first statement. So if you read nothing else, read that. Um, but again, it comes back to what I said before, which is what is important to the person who's interviewing you. You know, at the end of the day, that's the age old people buy people, you know, ex expression. Um, and, you know, that is important. You know, th there is a human being who, you know, got up this morning and, and maybe didn't have their duvet flip moment and didn't want to come to work um, or dealt with a problem with their kids or, you know, whatever it is. And, and that's who's sitting across from you. That's the person who's doing the interview. So how do you connect with that human being? How do you make sure that they see value in you um, and are going to choose you over someone else? But it, it comes back to empathy, I think. And how important is a thank you message afterwards? Yeah, it's funny because... Um, you know, one of the things I'm trying to get my kids to do now, I, I've mentioned Luke, my oldest, but we have three. And uh, one of the things I'm trying to get my kids to do now is whenever somebody says, how are you? Make sure that you go, I'm fine, thank you. And how are you? Um, and I think it's, it's a bit like that, right? Is, is, you know, maybe in the moment they're a little bit intimidated because it's an interview and people aren't comfortable doing it. So that doesn't come naturally to anyone to go into an interview situation. But try and, you know, train yourself in advance and remember in advance to, to be polite and to thank them for the interview and ask if they've got any remaining questions or whatever it is. Absolutely. And we've only got time for two more questions. And my, fin my first one of the final two is, what do you believe is your invisible success that has made you successful? What we can't find online in your yeah. career. What made you go from that tractor on that resort to global board to the CEO of a yeah. billion dollar company? Um, I think, um, I'm not sure it's going to help anyone here, but I think I, I've, um, I, I take pride in the fact that I have a way of articulating something that's sometimes quite complex in an extremely simple way. And what I say to the people around me that work with me is like, look, I, I need to understand this in simple terms. If you give me a really complex uh, answer, like, I, that doesn't work for me. I, I, it's harder to get to the simple explanation. Um, but if I don't understand it clearly and I can't articulate it clearly, then people aren't going to be able to go and do it. And I think there's a, for me, it's really important that uh, there's, there's an expression again in, in, in our industry or in, in business in general that says execution eats strategy for breakfast. Um, I think sometimes people insert culture, but it's, it's, it's execution. And you can have the best strategy poorly executed, you get nowhere. And if you want people to execute on the strategy, then they have to understand what it is that you want them to do how they should do it and what's in it for them. Um, and you have to do that in very simple terms to get them to go after it and do it. And I think that's my superpower. My superpower is being able to take what might be a relatively complex uh, task, or it might be simple, but being able to translate that into something that people can then go after and go and do. Oh, wow. You've put me under pressure now a little bit <laughs> because I hope I've explained the concept of my duvet flip in a simple term so you understand it. And my final question is, what's your duvet flip? What gets you out of bed in the morning to flip the duvet? Um, I think I've touched on it a few times today, which is, you know, I, I, again, maybe like a lot of uh, people my age, I realise that I'm on the back end of my career now um, and I want to make the most of it. I want to, you know, I want to be able to help as many people as I can and influence as many people as I can. Um, I didn't mention it today, but my wife and I have a charity focused on, uh, on empowering young girls and helping young girls to realize uh, that they can be anything that they want to be. Um, and, you know, whether it's the charity Inner Wings that we have or whether it's, uh, you know, going out there to do a great job at IFS or on one of the boards that I sit on, um, you know, I just want to make my remaining time count. Um, and you, you hear stories about people who get diagnosed and are terminally ill 
and then you know they've got a year left or six months left and then all of a sudden they're like you know i need to make the most of this time well we all are in that situation we're all dying um the only question is when um and it's a question of like what are you going to do with the remaining time and that that's my duvet flip wow and i'm going to say it again darren you're halfway <laughs> the hundred mark and on that note i just want to say thank you for your kindness thank your you. energy your wisdom your honesty keeping things simple which is always great for our audience and taking time out of your busy schedule to come here with just open arms so thank you thank you jack and until next time we'll see you next time can sometimes feel a bit puzzling. Maybe it's that confusing car insurance policy or working out the right protection for your health, home and family. Or feeling unsure if your pension is on the right path. Aviva can help make these conundrums click. Helping solve your financial puzzles? It takes Aviva. Is what you're doing still doing it for you? I am EY. For a purpose that inspires me. And a culture that accepts. For a team that relies on me and makes me better for knowing I'm always respected for being absolutely me. For my work to have meaning, ideas becoming actions and my direction my own. For leaders that challenge, guide and support, empowering me to be all I can and bring everything I am. My skills accelerated, my voice amplified. For always feeling heard and saying without hesitation, I love what I do. That's why, EY. Mom, I got the job! She got the job! Who got the job? <laughs> Ready! She got the job! She got the job! She got the job! Ha <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Find your I got the job job on Total Jobs.